Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being with us again. We have four special guests joining us today. We have John Calder, Director of Retail Sales and Acoustic Geometry based in the East Coast in Minnesota. We have <laughs> James Lindenschmidt, who is a room designer and audio geek at GIK Acoustics based in Atlanta. We have Jeff Clark, Director of Software Engineering at Odyssey in LA, California. And we have our own Scott Orth, our own Director of Audio and Acoustics at Sound United in Baltimore. Hosting from his lovely theater home today is Phil Jones, our Director in Carlsbad, San Diego. Take it away, Phil. But there's a couple of points that I wanna stress before we even get started. Number one, this is a very detailed topic. People are really fascinated about how sound works and how to make sound um, work well in their room. The next thing is there's solutions for everyone. We're going to be talking about some solutions that could be quite expensive and some just quick tips that you can do, whether it's rugs or heavy curtains or putting your subwoofer in the proper position that's going to help the acoustics in your room. So there's something here for everyone how um, not only can you have reflections, you also have, your room can also affect your, your system's frequency response. So, so Scott's team goes out and builds the perfect speaker. And of course, we can we go over down a rabbit hole about the perfect speaker. Um, and even in our company, between the definitive and Polk guys, it's like, it's like, it's like a, um, a, you know, fight! you know, kind of think about which way they want to go. But they go and they build this speaker that has very even frequency response. And it works. And then you put it in your room and that's not what you get. So, so, uh, so John, can you talk about what a node is and, and how that actually happens? Yes. And, and something to remember is that depending on the size of your room, at some point, the room is going to cross over to what's at a, what's called a shorter frequency to pressure based rather than um, velocity based. Because what's happening in the room is let's say you have a 12 foot width. Um, and so that's roughly 100 hertz or so, a little more. At that frequency, um, the room no longer supports a full wavelength. And so the, the sound in the room becomes more pressure oriented. It also resonates at that frequency. It's called a standing wave or an eigentone. Um, and what happens is the room likes to just let that one note run forever because there's nothing to absorb it. It's, it's finding no acoustical resistance. And so what you're finding at each of the three main dimensions, length, width, height, and in complicated L-shaped rooms or ovals, you're going to get different results. But basically what's happening is at the resonant frequencies of the room, which usually correspond to one or all of the dimensions, the sound will just bounce back and forth. And so at those points, you can be in phase and get a, a doubling or quadrupling of the sound energy, or you can stand at a cancellation place and get almost none. Um, they're called nodes and antinodes. They make up room modes and uh, the software for detecting those or figuring them out is getting better. But um, what's happening in the picture on the right is the deep blue is at 63 hertz in that room. If you're standing there, you're not going to hear 63 hertz very much at all. Now, if that corresponds to the note in the bass guitar, and that's the key that the song is in, in this particular recording studio, and you're the bass guitar player, you're going to be very unhappy. So move about two feet. <laughs> You'll hear that note really well. So what happens is, you know, unfortunately, the measuring technologies that we've got are mostly based on frequency response, not timing. And this is really more of a timing issue, <clears throat> excuse me, because really what we're trying to do is just reduce those reflections so they don't come back and interact with each other. Um, but the room modes are difficult and they're problematic and they're usually below anywhere between 120 and 200 hertz. You can absorb the low frequencies and that's somewhat of a controversial topic um, and you can also work with subwoofer placement in terms of where that goes in the room and and how to best utilize um, the room's dimensions in your own favor as opposed to being against you okay so basically this if a dedicated room move your speakers so the knoll is not at the listing position 
if you can't move your speakers, if you can, move your seat. If you're that, you know, because I hear people make these dedicated sound rooms and they might, you know, and they put their chair right here. You know what? If it's a null, you know, I don't want to move my speakers. Well, take your damn seat and move it back to or forward to or, uh, and tell your speakers in a little bit more. And that can help you get rid of that as well. James, um, Sebastian from Poland loves the beard, man. He oh, great. Awesome. <laughs> so I Jim, worked hard for this. I earned it. <laughs> yeah, by the way, he insulted me in the process. So thanks, Sebastian. <laughs> Especially after I said welcome back and everything. So, yeah, appreciate that. Okay, one um, more. Fred? Yes, uh, oh, we have an interesting one. question with regards to budgeting. If you're doing projects like home theaters, and this is a question from Asif Khan. Uh, so, if you're doing a project for home theater that require acoustic treatments, what minimum percentage of the room area should be treated with absorption and diffusion? Can you touch a little bit upon diffusers in surround setup modes? And then uh, attached to this is how good are pyramid diffusers? And he's referring to the classic ones. So I'm gonna let James tackle that one. Go ahead, James. Yeah, sure. Um, again, for, for me, it all comes down to balance. There's no magic number that's gonna be correct for every room in terms of what percentage of absorption, what percentage of diffusion. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to depend on what's happening. Um, and, you know, uh, probably less than 10% of the rooms that I work on are do whatever you have to do to get perfect sound, like really high-end rooms where we can do anything we want acoustically to get the best sound. Most of my clients are, um, you know, in you know, shared living spaces, there's compromises, in other words, whether it's from upper management approving the look of things, you know, like we talked about earlier, to it's a shared living space, so we can't always do what we need to do. So you want to sort of optimize it, um, and I'm kind of evading the question there, uh, but there really is no uh, uh, specific percentage that I'd be comfortable saying. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in average household size rooms, you can start to hear improvements with just a few panels if they're placed well, particularly, um, you know, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, if you can fill the room with panels and they're the right kind of panels in the right balance, we can get really, really amazing results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the short answer is it depends. Now I will say that both companies offer um, comp consulting. And we'll talk right. about that a little later. So you let them know what, um, uh, describe your room, give them dimensions, things like that, mm -hmm. what's in it, um, kind of give them an idea. Uh, of course, it's better right. if they're there. Um, but then they can kind of make, based on their years of experience, recommendations, which will probably work best for your space. Um, right. Oh, by the way, I got to give John, John is a testimonial on here from Mel. Mel had um, bought his uh, bought acoustic geometry curved uh, diffusers um, at Magnolia, which we will show you what those look like a little later. And he is a happy camper, so we will go through and show more solutions along the way. Now let's talk back about this knoll thing that we were talking about. So um, we have this dip, and a lot of that has to do with how a speaker interacts in a room. And a lot of times, some of these knolls, um, uh, these dips in the room. The, you throw even if you throw a tremendous amount of equalization at them, you you can only you can only boost the signal so much. If you look at Odyssey, Odyssey gets to the point, right, Jeff, that sometimes it says, "Can't do anything with that," right? That's right. That's right. Uh, you you can you know something that cancels perfectly, it's it's going to it'll suck up any amount of energy you put into it. So exactly. it's not going to change. Okay. So the first thing is is placement and um and Scott. You want to talk about what this is? Or do you want the subwoofer sure. crawl? Okay. Well, it's a uh, it's it's based on the uh, the reciprocity principle. So we're trying to find where the best place in the room to put the uh, subwoofer is. So you take the subwoofer, put it where you would be listening, and then crawl around the room and listen to the subwoofer. And wherever it sounds best, that's where you put the subwoofer. Exactly. And um, so this is a lot. So this takes a little bit. This actually works because now this is not going to eliminate all the knolls and the stuff in the room. It just makes sure that those problems that you're having in the room are n are not where you're sitting. So you may be able to walk over in the left corner of the room where no one is sitting and there's a problem. But who cares if there's a problem over there? It's not the money seat where you're sitting. So this allows you to get the best sound 
where you're sitting. Now I have bad knees. So um, there's another, this is what the mad scientist uh, Jeff was messing with. And, and this actually not only talks about a technique you can use, but it also proves the theory of reciprocity. So Jeff, talk about what this is. Yeah, this is fun. So this is this is the app that works with the, the Denon and Marantz AVRs. And you can use this as a tool to uh, to save your knees by <laughs> placing the what I've done, and this is this is my room. Um, this is the subwoofer is uh, in the upper picture is in the seat that I am sitting in right now. And uh, you can't quite see it very well, but there's the microphone is on a little tripod over in my coat rack. Um, and that was just one of the places that I happened to ha happen to test out to see if if the um, speaker might work well there. Uh, it works, you know, the, you would say that the before response there doesn't look great. It doesn't, but it's correctable, at least for frequency. And um, so this might be a candidate spot. So I wanted to prove it out. I've done this before, but it's always fun to see things in, in action. And so I put the microphone back in the in the, the seat that I'm sitting in. I moved the subwoofer, the big black box, back over to under the coats. And if you look at the response from the the first one to the second one, they're almost exactly the same. Um, the before response, the green response on on the left is almost identical. So it just proves out that theory that it it absolutely works. Um, and you can take this a step further with the app. Um, you can walk. You can take that microphone around the room in different places and test all the different locations that you might want to place the subwoofer. For me, putting the subwoofer under that coat rack doesn't actually work that well because then I can't open my front door. <laughs> so uh, more, you more open the door. Thing. This get yourself some top ramen and and and, and a and a ninety nine pack of a, a ninety nine pack of a PBR and just live in the house for the rest of your life. That's all you. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter. Once you have good sound, you're gonna spend all your time in there anyway. So right. Yeah, I got other doors. I got other doors. Um, actually, there are uh, there are other places that are just as good in this room, and there are places where maybe we'll see that the subwoofers are that are not as good. Yeah, so I love this because he sent this to me to kind of show um, uh, a, a real world and, a, and and as a proving demonstration. Now, this is, by the way, if you don't know, um, if you have a Denon or Marantz um, AVR, we utilize Odyssey, which is uh, Jeff is the software engineer for this. And there is an app that is available that you can purchase for $20 to go in and gives you a lot more tools for utilizing um, for setup of Odyssey for your receivers, but it also has all these other little hidden benefits and tools, gems that you can use it for. Now, I believe, uh, James, you sent this. We always yeah. say well, uh, another thing you can do is besides crawling around, instead of buying one big sub, you should, a lot of times it's better to buy two smaller ones or me, two right. big subs, you know, but divide the money. Multiple subs are better than one. Can you go through and explain what's going on? Yeah, sure. This is, um, um... Yeah, the, 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 the multiple subwoofer thing is a technique where um, you can sort of use those different phase cancellations we've kind of alluded to. You know, the position of a speaker in the room is going to have a set of um, response anomalies that go with it uh, that are related to the distance between the subwoofer and nearby surfaces, right? Um, and in this case, in the drawing, you can see three traces there. There's a, a, a blue one, a, a, an orange one, and a green one. And the blue and the orange ones are each subwoofer individually playing alone. Okay, and those are the test results. So you can see the orange curve at about 70 hertz has a dip there, um, and the purple one has a dip at about 50 hertz or so. Um, and, you know, quite a few different things. Uh, but both of them together or the green curve. And if you look at the variance, the frequency response variance between the two curves, the green one's a little bit louder, which we would expect, right? Because there's two drivers playing. So that gives us about a 3 dB boost, which is our, our, what we see there. And then also another 3 dB from the fact that we're using, it's a powered subwoofer. So we're doubling the amplifier power too as well. So it's about 6 dB louder on average, which is what we'd expect. But it's also flatter. It's almost the best of both worlds. You know, because you can see where um, the brown curve is sort of flatter at 50 and has a null at 70, and the purple curve is sort of flatter at, at uh, 70 but has a null at 50, and they kind of combine in the green curve. Uh, so we get some beneficial interaction there. So we're using the fact that 
where the speaker is in the room um, is going to affect the sound and each speaker is going to affect the other sound and we're going to sort of exploit that to our advantage and get a positive result so that's the idea behind multiple subwoofers and in this case it's just two you can get even more improvement with like four subwoofers if they're placed well yeah um so yeah hey phil so yes there, go ahead there, yeah there's more to it um sure than yeah. this. so um I, I i don't know if you guys know this but i teach at uh, peabody and we talk about this quite a bit because what's going on with multiple subs is you're actually, if you do it properly, you're actually getting rid of some of the room modes. Mm -hmm. Right. You can actually cancel them out. Exactly. And the, the, and, and, the, and, and that just doesn't just make the frequency response flatter. It also right. removes the ringing of that mode. Right. So you're going to get a tighter bass response. And not only that, but if you're getting rid of that mode, that means that the listening space, you know, say you have a home theater, is going to be more even across each seat. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now that's a so that's a huge point. There that's are a huge, huge. lots of benefits to multiple subs. Yeah. So then that's a huge point because a lot of times when we talk about this and we're talking about subwoofer crawl, I say you do a subwoofer crawl for the front for one sub and a subwoofer crawl for the second sub, and you get the perfect spot for that sub, the rest of the room could be horrible. But and that does not apply when you get into something like like home theater. Jim um, Crowley helps has always been when I first arrived here. He always brings as many subwoofers as he possibly can. <laughs> or we do a lot of demonstrations using our definitive BP towers, which have powered subs built in. You put six of those in a room plus four um, super cubes. The base is even, <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and and because when I'm doing a show, I only not only have to impress the, I can't just have one good seat, um, because there's 15 people in this room coming in and out, and I can't explain to them. Well, you know the, um, and spend five minutes explaining that there's a null in the room because the interactive of the space in the room is rectangular and blah 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 blah. They're gonna say, in my seat, it sounds bad. So so by having multiple subs, it gives us the ability to even that out. So we could go over, people are going to say, where should I place my sub? It's how many do you have? How big is your room? Are you trying to do the, to make one spot sound really good or even bass response throughout the room? All of those things go together to determine this. We've even talked with Jeff about if um, our sub, our receivers now can equalize, it has two outputs. A lot of receivers, those two outputs are the same are the same it's just a why on our receivers we can out we can basically equalize and those two outputs differently so if i have four subs and how do i pair them well, i i put these you know these two should be paired on this sub output and these two should be paired on this sub output based on how they're interacting in the room so we can go way down the rabbit hole when it comes to putting a sub in for many of you you do not have that problem you can do the sub crawl because there's only a few money seats in your room. As you get into the home theater, that's where the, the knowledge of having someone like Scott or James or John that you can contact about your space and how many subs you want to put in it. They can give you kind of a recommendation, not only the treatment you should put in your room, but where you should put your subs in the room. And if all that doesn't work, Jeff has his superhero shirt on to the rescue to try to fix any other any other problems that you have. So I know if I I was going to bring up a slide about subwoofer placements, but it would have been it would have been the battle royale <laughs> if I bring that up because there's the two channel solution, the multi channel solution, the the one sweet spot solution, the wide sweet spot solution, the dual equalization solution and my head would have exploded, all right? So I think <laughs> we may have to have a whole 90 minutes um, that I may have to bring these guys back on how to place, how to get the best base from subwoofer placement, because that is a 90 minute conversation that I don't think we can, we, we can go there right now, okay? So I just wanted to bring that up. So you just remember, more subs are better than one. Actually, uh, let's go back at Jeff. What the heck is this? This actually kind of proves it again. Yeah, this is this is that experiment, the same experiment. It's um, there's a sub on the left, and there's a sub on the right, and so you can see the the first measurements, the measurement of each one by itself, 
the one on the left of the couch and the one on the right of the couch. And you can see that neither of those are, are correcting very well. You can also see they each have a null and you can't tell the frequency from the size of this graph, but it's around 70 Hertz. And when we put them both together, the response is not perfect, but it's better and it's more correctable. And we can, we can flatten that out. Um, the, there is a problem, which is that 70 Hertz, since neither of the subwoofers is able to produce 70 Hertz in the listening position, we still can't fix that problem. So this is where uh, better placement of these subs would improve the response and re improve uh, the result. So we want to, uh, and also some room treatment. So between some room treatment, good placement, Odyssey doesn't have to work as hard. Odyssey can give you a better final result if you start at a higher level. Yep, so keep it as simple. Best base, multiple subs, proper placement, treatment, equalization and hopefully you'll get there <laughs> okay of course there's multiple levels of absorption so i'm going to show J um, james's in a second but if you really want the mega um and you have and and you're buying some hundred thousand dollar system or doing some crazy studio you can spend some money on some really 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 effective and but they're not they're premium costing um low absorb um, low frequency absorption so what are these and what is this room early on we we looked at building diffusers that had a value add and my insistence on putting a, a mass loaded vinyl membrane in the back of the the cylindrical diffuser um went down a journey that kind of led me to understanding a, a lot more than i knew when i started about low frequency absorption um, and it has a lot to do with velocity versus pressure, where in the room that um, membrane should be or where in the room anything else should be. And so we, we tested, um, uh, I can't remember how many, I think 15 or 16 curves uh, in this test facility. It is literally the only one in the Western hemisphere capable of accurately testing down to 30 Hertz. And so we tested this stuff, we tested the curves, they had a hole at around 100 Hertz, but otherwise they were pretty good down about a 45 Hertz range and tailed off a little bit. And then we designed um, a thing called the corner sorber, which is again, a membrane absorber. And so we built these to go into a corner, corners, trihedral corners have all room modes present. So that's the best place to deal with base. You see a lot of base absorbers built into corners um, because that's where all the modes are. All the room modes exist there. Mm -hmm. So that basically was our rabbit hole in, in learning now, testing and learning which labs work and which don't. Now, these are really, really high end. How much would that array cost that's just sitting there? Um, they, they are sold in pairs. That pair on your upper left is um, about $1,000. Okay. So, yeah. So and this it works is in a conjunction with curves. So if you add the price of a half a dozen curves to this, um, yeah. It starts getting expensive for low frequency exactly. absorption. Yeah, and these work really good. But actually, I have also used uh, James's corner loaded ones, and I've gotten mm -hmm. great results from those. Now, of course, as you spend more money and you pay a premium, there's a reason why you're paying a premium. So but it all depends on your budget. The goal is to provide people with solutions at a variety of different levels. Once you get addicted and you realize what the benefit of treatments are, um, then you become motivated. When you finally put a pair of heavy curtains on um, over a, a glass door and you realize, wow, that made a big difference, or you buy an absorption, some absorption panels, and you realize that makes a big difference, then you want to get into the fusion and, and low frequency absorption and you start to see the benefits of it. And how much you should spend is based on um, a lot of things. You're not going to spend thirty thousand dollars on room treatments for a thousand dollar system, you know, or for a um, but a studio will spend thirty thousand dollars in a recording studio in a, in a split second because they make money off of it. Or if you go out and and buy a hundred thousand dollar high end audio system, um, you should spend. You need to spend a good percentage of of money on the treatments. I'm trying to figure out a percentage. Why don't we say you should spend at least 15 to 20% of the cost of the system to make the room sound good, all right? 
you can make it and, and you can do it in a way that it does not offend the, the design committee and you will get more performance from the equipment that you're buying. OK, the um, Scott's team spends a bunch of time trying to make those speakers sound great. The the receiver team spends a bunch of time trying to make the receiver give you the best possible sound and the best surround sound. Jeff tries his best to make sure it's equalized correctly. Spend a little time, invest a little money in your syst in your room to ensure that you get the most performance from the gear you bought. It's almost like it. Uh, do not remove, reduce is the thing that I always say. Do um if you don't just take it out because you can't afford it, you'd be better off buying um stepping down a little bit on the audio system to afford the acoustic treatments because you will get overall a better experience in your room. The ones that we use were these with the triangular corner traps. Mm. We use those at CES and actually after CES, I actually took them and put them in my makeshift room uh, along with some diffusion and some absorption to replace my DIY ones. And it made a, it made a big difference even in my little um, drywall box that I was using for makeshift theater. So there's a lot of different options. I encourage you to go to both sites, look at all the different options, talk to both companies to determine what is the best approach. Now, what's with the, with the, um, the is the wood kind of a diffuser, James, on the front of that? Yeah, that's, uh, that. There, and you're talking about the, uh, the black triangular unit with the wood plate on the front of it with holes cut out in it. That's our uh, corner alpha series. It's part of our alpha. And uh, we haven't really talked about that style of diffusion at all. We did talk about it. And in fact, the, the custom built one behind me is this same category of diffuser. It's a hybrid device. Um, when we put, um, when, when we alternate spots of absorption and reflection, um, on the front of an absorber like that, a thick enough absorber to be active at lower frequencies. Um, it's uh, uh, when you do it in a specific way, that will also create some diffusion. You know, it's not as efficient as some of the other designs. It doesn't create as much diffusion, in other words, um, but it does do some. And uh, it's another way of getting the better balanced sound that we talked about earlier. So yes, that's a one dimensional uh, alpha panel on the front of that. And it does offer some scattering and diffusion uh, across the left and right plane. Okay. Note, just like if you look at the diffusers behind Jeff, there's some science behind the madness of how what those right. um, how what the slots are on a quadratic or the height uh, or the height of those little cubes on Jeff's diffuser. The same thing with these slots. You don't just right. cut a bunch of slots randomly and expect for them right. to work. All right. There's science right. behind all of this. And like I said, there's Absolutely. pros and cons for every single type. And the best, and you look at them all and say, based on my budgets, what my budget and my room and the design committee, what's the pros and cons? And you try to make the best educated decision. And so what are we showing here, James, real quick? Yeah, these are waterfall graphs from my own room, actually, this room I'm sitting in now. And um, I, I, it's basically a before and after treatment graph, a waterfall graph showing um, how the base trapping helped. Um, and one of my motivations for creating this graph was uh, earlier when we were talking about multiple subwoofers. Um, and yeah, I agree, I'm a huge fan of that strategy and I think it helps a ton. Uh, but there was a lot of conversation out there um, a few years ago saying, well, if you use multiple base or, or multiple subwoofers, you don't need base traps. And to me, that's just, I want to use every tool at my disposal, like you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. I want to do everything I can to improve the sound. So the left graph is my room with both subwoofers going with no bass traps, no treatments at all. That's just a plain untreated room. And uh, that's better than either subwoofer on its own, for sure. But the right graph is what happened after I added the bass traps. And you can see the decay times are much more consistent. The frequency response is more consistent. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, another way to show that um, we want to use everything we can to get the best possible sound. Yes. Now, I will I will point out that John, John will mention that there's multiple ways and multiple measurement things and there's pros and cons to all of those. Sure. The difference is they have all the tools. So they <laughs> so if they tell you to do something, it's it's based on life experience between John's lab, between Scott's lab. John's toys and James toys and their measuring devices, a lot of this and their knowledge of doing this for years, um, there's a method to the madness. So when they tell you to put this right. here, 
most likely there's a there's a real reason. It isn't it isn't voodoo or witchcraft. They're actually it's based on their experiences and the way that they test. But this actually right. is another example to show you that there is a difference. And then last but not least, if you you do all of the stuff like we talked about, you you, you uh, we're gonna have a whole less session with Scott about where did you place your speakers. We'll have another set, and Scott will also come and talk about different types of speakers and how they interact with your room. So you pick the right equipment. You put the equipment in the right spot. You spend the 15 to 20% at least on proper treatments based on your budget for your system <laughs> to get the best sound out of your room. And then last but not least, Jeff flies in with Odyssey to allow you to try to fix those last bits of things. That is going to give you the maximum performance. So the first thing is there's lots of options. Both companies offer um, room kits that um, that are prepackaged. Now the room kits can vary in pricing depending on are you using diffusion, what type of diffusion, what type of, um, of absorb frequency absorption or or traps are you using. So they can the prices can vary widely or, or um, and and a wide amount, but there are both companies offer kits, so you can go there, and if you're trying to say, okay, I have this type of room, where should I start? John, you have kits for studios, and you have kits for um, kind of recommended kits for home theater. Um, so there's a lot of different things, and I think both companies do that. And like I said, you can go in and get almost like a value pack, and, if you, and you can supersize that value pack. Um, depending on your budget and their applications and the quality of the fusion and absorption that you're using, correct? Correct. And, and okay. both companies, just about every acoustics company is going to try and give you some savings if you're buying multiple panels of some kind or another. Um, and exactly. it's best to do some online shopping. You know, we exactly. really recommend that you look around and look at the mm -hmm. solutions. Yeah, so if you look at this high-end studio kit, it's about nine thousand dollars. But James, you guys offer kits that start that are under that are well, that are what a thousand as well. Uh, yeah, our our most basic kit I think is just under six hundred. Uh, it's like five eighty one I think. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's right under six hundred plus shipping. Um, and for us, I mean, we've only got a few kits, like four or five kits, and. Um, we keep those really simple and straightforward and versatile, so they'll you know work in just about any room. You can make them work. Um, but a big part of what we do is um, uh, what me and my colleagues do as far as design work. So we'll actually customize a, a sort of an a la carte package designed for your room. Um, so that's most of what I do. Uh, GIK does have kits available, and, and every once in a while, I'm like, you know what? You need kit number two. That's the best use for your budget. Yeah, but yeah, in most cases, it's always better. Customs right. Yeah. Off. Exactly. But I will tell you, a six hundred dollar kit <laughs> oh, yeah. right. is not going to give you the performance of a eight thousand dollar kit. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You Absolutely. Get what you pay for. And, and that yeah. People... Um, one of the points is that everybody who who sells acoustical products offers basically modular units. So right. you can start with a two or three hundred dollar six pack of two by two fabric wrap fiberglass absorbers and because they're modular you can add and so if you right. want to start with fiberglass or something that's inexpensive and looks pretty good mm -hmm. you can change the colors so you know we encourage people to think about um, when you're good better best you don't have to start with best you can actually start with a smaller grouping and then yeah. add as your budget or as your ears um, yeah. demand and yeah and most likely to spot remember, these are all modular they basically yeah. go on your wall or ceiling and, right. and can yeah around. so if you buy a pair of diffusers and uh, then all of a sudden you buy another a better pair of diffusers you don't throw the old diffusers away you just put them in a different location um, right. same thing if you buy absorption and then you decide you want to swap out some of the absorption for some diffusion you can put them in another location in that space or guaranteed there's another space in your room in your house where they would probably bit you could probably get benefit from them so so you don't it's it's one of those things it grows so you can you can start building a collection of tools like no one has one wrench and then when they get a new wrench they throw the old wrench away you know what i mean <laughs> you just continue to add wrenches and screwdrivers to your toolbox and now you just have more tools you can pull out based on your situation we do a lot of trade shows and our biggest challenge at a trade show is you can't drill anything into the wall. It has to be freestanding and it has to fit the design committee. And literally at Sound United, we have a design 
committee um, thing, and it has to meet. And Scott wants it to sound good because he because we're trying to show off something that he made. Uh, we always say proper planning results in optimum performance, or not optimum. Um, enhanced performance because no matter this room is still not going to be a great room this was a hotel room in the venetian and it was a combination of panels from a company called snow sound which were these tall slick freestanding ones plus um a gik acoustic uh traps so we had a home theater as well as a two channel room and you can see the uh the planning at the beginning and then the end result and these rooms actually sounded pretty darn good and the, our director of design and marketing was still happy. Literally, the direct the design committee was okay with the way that the room looked because it kind of fit our, our branding of our red and black that, um, and it kind of worked out. And um, so, so yeah, planning, planning, planning. And, uh, and like I said, there's tons and tons of solutions. This is actually what we put in that room. Now, we're not saying that this is the only solution, but this is what we could afford based on our budget and what would fit the cosmetic um, approval of the team that actually wanted to do the space. So this was not the, to do the traveling case. You got to exactly. be able to slip it out of there when you're done. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So we needed something that week that was light enough to care travel with pretty enough that people aren't going to, that would, that would fit the design and, and fit the budget that they gave me to do it. So, so this is not, so this combination could be a totally different combination for you. But for this room, that was the, the choice that we made based on the, the recommendations for people in our company and the cosmetics that we were trying to achieve. All the companies that are in the acoustics business also, as you'll see in the center there, offer um, business solutions. And so for yes. people who have a conference room that sounds terrible, as well as their home stereo room that sounds terrible, a lot of the same tools will work in any room that just doesn't sound very good. And yep. you need to kind of remember that these are tools that are used universally. And a lot of the research that's been done has been done in for business applications, which is why we can offer some really good uh, test numbers, because a lot of the testing was paid for by businesses who really needed their conference rooms or their lobbies to sound better. Yep. So yep. we get the benefit of that in the hi-fi or pro recording exactly. uh, industry. So I just want to give you a couple of examples. So Mel mentioned that he had went to uh, Magnolia and he got the acoustic geometry um, solution. So this is their premium room. The reason why there's so many <laughs> treatments in this room is because this room has um, these four Martin Logans um, on this wall, three pairs of BMW on another wall, maybe a pair of Kef blades on a on the third wall and two or three other pairs of speakers on the fourth wall. So there's speakers on all four walls of this room and the listener may be sitting um, facing any one of those directions, standing up because people won't sit down. You tell them to sit down to listen, but they'll stand up. So it's gotta sound good standing up, sitting down in all different orientations. So this is an extreme example, but it shows how you can make Regardless of your application, you can make it sound good. Yeah. We we really overbuilt these rooms, um, but they sound pretty good. And on top of that, both James and John also mentioned smaller rooms require more treatment. And this is not a very big room, considering how many how many speakers are in here. One, wow. one other important point I'd like to make, if you don't mind, is um, a lot of acoustics performance is about surface area. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, especially like with absorption, diffusion, bass trapping, how much surface area do we have of all the panels together relative to the size of the room? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would argue that if everything's balanced in terms of you're in, 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 in other words, you're making the right choices about what kinds of devices we're using in the room, the more you have in the room, the higher the potential for sound if it's a good design. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as an example, if, if you go into like a really high end control room for a studio, like a million dollar room built from the ground up to sound good, right? The walls that you see in a room like that are false walls, um, fiber covered typically, or maybe there's hybrid diffuser and devices in there. Uh, but pretty much every wall in a room like that that's designed for audio accuracy um, is going to be covering like 
two feet thick of absorption and base trapping, right? So mm -hmm. there's a ton of treatments in those rooms in terms of surface area. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, I definitely think it's, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. It's definitely a good idea to not just have like a whole bunch of thin absorbers in your room and then call that done because that's going to be dead at the highs and still boomy in the base and no diffusion. And it's going to be very unbalanced and not sound very good. But if you're making better strategic choices about what you're putting in the room, I think um, as you add products, if it's a good design, you're just going to keep getting better and better and better until the room's literally full of, of treatments. Yeah, exactly. Now, now the other thing too, that I want to stress is if you saw the first room, the premium room, it's obvious that that room is full of treatments. And right. sometimes I like, look, I, I'm the guy that has the seven foot tall rack of hi-fi behind me. <laughs> I, I like people knowing that my room is designed for listening. But a lot of right. times people pay a premium not to see this stuff. Um, hence the fabric walls and theaters and high-end recording studios because it needs to look as pretty and as impressive right. as humanly possible. So Magnolia, by the way, if you don't know what the Magnolia Design Center is, for those people who are not in the U.S., uh, Magnolia is a division of Best Buy, and Best Buy is the largest um, retailer in America, probably globally if you look at how, how many stores they have and how many dollars they make. And they have a high-end division called Magnolia Design Center for customers who are looking, very discerning customers to go and look at not only great, great audio and video equipment, but also what could be done. And, of course, they can install it. Um, U.S. has a lot of other high-end installation dealers, but this is one of the biggest when it comes to high-end because of it's a division of the biggest audio company. And they went to, um, to John's company and asked them to – um, they're building they were building these Magnolia home theaters in select stores and they wanted to show what could be done and how good it can sound without it looking like there's a bunch of stuff being done. So you look um, all of those green dots represent stuff in this room. So John, real quickly, quick summary. What's in this room um, and what those dots represent? Well, to James' point, um, in a recording studio, you're just going to see a sort of a flat fabric finish on a wall. And behind the fabric on this, there's absorption and some reflection um, built in. But it's a nice, even kind of a, a monochromatic look. Mm -hmm. um, and the art that's there is similar to the art panels that GIK offers. These are um, acoustic wall art except that these particular ones have holes cut out in the absorption material through which the, the surround speakers can work. And, and the ceiling is basically one inch fiberglass with back, black fabric over it, but it's a, a star field ceiling. And so what you're seeing is LEDs fed through um, uh, fiber optics. Um, there's a soundproof door there that we make. It's about three inches thick and weighs about 300 pounds. The, the metal surfaces are actually quilted uh, stainless steel curved diffusers. So a lot of this stuff can be disguised. And the trend in any acoustical products company, with a few exceptions, um, the good ones are really starting to offer stealth acoustics, things that don't really look like um, an acoustics panel in a room, per se, but will actually help. Maybe not as much. You may need more of um, an acoustic wall art uh, to achieve the same goal. But nonetheless, um, it won't be observed as a, uh, an acoustic treatment. Yeah. So here's another um, system, uh, another one. And if you look at this room, um, there, uh, with the exception of maybe the two diffusers on the wall, which are pretty nondescript, you wouldn't even really notice those because how, how well they blend into the wall. And then the wall art and all of the other solutions in here. Plus, they also do special, these guys do specialized cabinetry and everything else. It looks nice. No, um, it will pass the design committee um, and it sounds good. So, oh, by the way, hiding stuff costs more than leaving it out in the open. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> these are just some examples that I pulled off of the, of the, the GIK site. And these are all um, art panels and examples of art panels that they offered. If you look at it, that stuff is pretty. <laughs> Even if right. it was just a painting uh, or a piece of art in my room, I would want that. And now the benefit is it actually makes my room sound better as well. And what James has done really smartly here, and something that I should mention, is that <laughs> this is very clever in this center bottom photo. You've got two really big, beautiful art pieces that are also absorbers. And it allows you, because it pulls your eye, 
to put some corner absorbers in and kind of sneak yeah. them into the picture and no one's going to say, <laughs> oh, you've got corner absorbers, I see. They don't look, you know. So right. in a lot of cases, you're just tricking the design committee into accepting your real acoustics exactly. with some really nice yeah. looking absorbers. And here's another tip. Remember we said there's two reflection, there's a reflection point, a first reflection on each wall for each speakers. Each speaker, so you look, you see there's two speakers in that room, but because that panel is so wide, it cap it can treat the reflection, the first reflection of both speakers. So you don't have to have two panels. You just have to have a panel that's big enough to cover the first reflection at the listening seat, at the listening position. I will tell you that we are going to do additional acoustic um, sessions because they are incredibly popular. And in the meantime, both sites or both companies have very detailed information about um, acoustic treatments and how sound works in the room. And I really, really, really encourage you to subscribe to their YouTube channels as well as my YouTube channel um, if you haven't and, and to learn more about these tips. And then we will bring um, Scott back to talk about the um, room acoustics and speakers, and then we will do another one on just bass, and then we'll go down the rabbit hole on just absorption versus diffusion. So we'll have more sessions because you guys um, are requesting them. So thank you guys again for coming, and thank you all. Uh, we're going to take a break for the next next week, and then yes. coming after that, new products and a whole lot of acoustic and speaker sessions. Okay, bye bye. Bye-bye. We'll so. see bye -bye. you bye -bye. next time.